Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I want to thank John and Mark and the Meadow family for this chance to come back home to Chicago and uh, try and embarrass Bill in front of all of you. Um, we'll see what I can do. Um, I uh, was a resident here, as John mentioned, from uh, 1997 to 2000, and I did my neonatology fellowship here from 2000 to 2003. And I've been out in San Francisco every, ever since. Um, I met my wife here, we got married and had our reception in the quad club, so I feel in a lot of ways like I grew up here and so it is kind of a homecoming. And Bill was a huge part of that. So I know that a lot of people will be talking about his uh, academic scholarship, his uh, uh, contributions as an ethicist, but I want to give a little different perspective as a trainee. So I want to talk about Bill as an uh, educator, a clinician, and really a life mentor. Uh, I know that like so many other trainees in the past, uh, I can say that I really would not be who or what I am today without Bill. So uh, it's not with hyperbole, but I'll try and explain exactly what I mean by that with my remarks. So um, some people have an amazing ability to plan out their careers from day one. They follow a very clear game plan from A to Z and they achieve their goals at any cost. That was not who I was. That was never one of my, uh, my moduses. Instead, I took a very circuitous route into medicine, and I tended to follow my interests and trust that they would eventually guide me to the right place. In my fourth year of medical school, I actually had done a NICU fellowship in Colorado. I did a pediatric surgery sub-I in Seattle. So I had an interest in neonatal intensive care, but for some reason, I never really envisioned myself as a neonatologist. I just did those things because I found them interesting. And whether it was a lack of confidence or I didn't think I had the right temperament for it or uh, I just had no idea how to plan a career like that, I just didn't see that for myself. I couldn't imagine it. So at the start of my intern year, uh, part of me still believed that there was a computer glitch in the National Res Re Residency Matching Program and I had matched into this program by mistake. So I was really thinking any day now somebody was going to call me and say, I'm sorry, there's been a terrible mistake, there's the, you're going to have to leave and make room for the person who really deserves to be here. So my strategy for residency was really about surviving month to month and not screwing up. So I wasn't really uh, career planning beyond much, uh, beyond the next rotation. So whether by luck or visionary planning on the part of the residency program, I was scheduled for my first rotation of my intern year in the NICU. And this was in July, and everyone knows that Bill takes service in July with all the new interns. And I think that's to make sure that we don't screw up and have any major disasters. I can remember trying to pre-round that day, not really knowing what I was doing, but standing there terrified, holding my papers, waiting for rounds to start. Um, in came Bill, bigger than life. He opened the door and he started smiling and chanting and saying, all of medicine is in neonatology. It was like he was quoting somebody, which of course he was, he was quoting himself. But uh, I think he, at that point, he, I think he did a little jig or a dance in his clogs and he reached out his hand and he said, hi, I'm Bill Meadow, welcome to the NICU, you're gonna love it here. It immediately set me at ease and I have loved neonatology ever since. I may be conflating my memory of this with the beginning of Willy Wonka, but it was very <laughs> similar. Uh, he clearly was the king of that domain, he ruled that domain and he exuded this brightness that was just irresistible. So he immediately set us at ease. Now some might take this uh, uh, nature as, or attitude as being cavalier or arrogant, but instead it really had a magical way of both reassuring us and diffusing the tension over this incredibly serious responsibility that we were about to take on. Every day Bill would enter the NICU with a flourish singing whatever struck his fancy, and during my time it was usually some song that Beanie had introduced him to, like, I'm Slim Shady, yeah, I'm the Slim Shady, <laughs> or uh, when I was a young warthog from Lion King. Um, and then there was always the Amherst fight song, which he would follow by prompting everybody on the team to represent their alma mater in song. Uh, so Bill always set the tone, and he really taught me that the attending really sets the, 
the tone for the team and the unit, and that anger and intimidation really have no place uh, in promoting a learning environment. When Bill was on service, he would come in almost every night to check on the unit. Maybe it was just when I was on call, but he, he, did, he did come in. And since he only lived a few blocks away, he would ride his bike into the hospital. And it was usually around 11 o'clock, right after George Michael's sports machine was over, which pre-ESPN days. Uh, and he would bring grapes or tangerines or, or donut holes. And, he would hand them to the nurses and the residents, and then he would sweep through the unit. And after about two minutes, he would have the entire unit assessed. Uh, it was really, really something amazing. I've never seen anyone who's able to do something like this and assess the acuity so quickly. Then he'd come up to you and he'd ask you, who do you think are the three sickest babies in the unit? Just to see if they would match his list. And of course, he was always right. But he would clue you into the babies you had to keep an eye out for. And sometimes they weren't the babies you, uh, you expected. So really, in 13 years of practice, and I've been at UCSF and met some giants in the field, uh, I have to put Bill still right at the top of my list as a neonatologist for his clinical acumen. Really, really astounding. Whenever babies were sick or families were grieving, Bill was always there to provide the right level of compassion and support. When trainees were melting down or frustrated on rounds, Bill could diffuse the tension with a deft touch. On rounds, if a resident was being argumentative, Bill would usually listen understandingly, smile, and walk over and give him a big hug. <laughs> when babies were dying and it was clear that we were only providing care at the end of life, Bill still set the tone and guided families to hold their babies. He understood the importance of those final minutes, regardless of what had happened in the previous months. Then Bill would always check to see if the nurses and the residents were OK. So Bill also taught me that attending meant being there at the bedside where you were needed. As everyone knows, Bill has a gift for language as well. He can turn a phrase like no other. One of my favorites that I still use is this concept of saving one therapy for later just in case you need it, just a little something extra. This could be an extra dose of Lasix, an extra presser, event setting of some sort. But Bill would call it leaving an arrow in your quiver. I always love that. Bill always gave us feedback at the end of the month as well. And I remember at the end of my intern rotation, he called me into his office and told me, you did a great job. You're a star. What do you want to do when you grow up? You should be a neonatologist. <laughs> I felt it was so over the top and so undeserved. I thought for sure it was another catchphrase that he was just spewing out. He probably said this to every intern. But I didn't care. I just felt great. And I knew that Bill had my back. Uh, and, and it's true. Ever since, I have felt that way. The following month, I uh, was on the wards in general pediatrics. And my medical student was my future wife, Janet. Apparently, that's frowned upon to date your medical students. But I'll leave that to the ethicists in the room to decide. <laughs> But uh, anyway, Janet uh, thought she wanted to be a surgeon at the time. And the following year, she matched into general surgery in Colorado. So being the poor planner that I am, I thought what I'll do is just follow her out to Colorado, get a job in general pedi pediatrics, and we'll live out the rest of our lives in Denver. Well, Janet came to her senses a few months later and realized that surgery was not for her. She wanted to do pediatrics after all, and she came back to Chicago. But that left me kind of scrambling, wondering what I was going to do after graduation. So I went to ask Bill for his advice, because I trusted him. And to my surprise, he offered me a fellowship spot here in neonatology right on the spot. He didn't ask me to send, me my, send him my updated CV or a personal statement or three letters of recommendation so he could set up a day of interviews. He just said, you should be a NICU fellow here. And I've been the program director at UCSF now for the last eight years, and I still am amazed that he would do that for me. It uh, clearly was a decision that changed my life forever and impacted all the patients, families, and trainees that I've encountered in neonatology ever since. Janet came back to UC here and completed her pediatric residency while I did my NICU fellowship. And my fellowship experience here was amazing, largely because of Bill and Dr. Lee and Dr. Singh, Mike Schreiber, Steve Wall, Jeremy. I had a great experience and great colleagues like Jen Liedel and Janelle Fuller, Leslie Calderelli, many of whom are here today. And 
As a resident, Janet always made sure that she made her schedule to be on in July with Bill. So she wanted to get every bit of learning from him as possible. Bill sponsored us for our wedding reception at the Quad Club when we got married, so we really feel kind of like he's a godfather for us and our, our child. So it's hard to overstate the influence that Bill has had on me and continues to have on my personal and professional life. Um, though Janet did her neonatology fellowship at UCSF, she still considers Bill to be one of her mentors. So I get a lot of secondhand exposure to Bill still through her all the time. There's probably not a month that goes by that Janet doesn't look at me sideways with exasperation and say, yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back now, I feel so fortunate to have trained here, and Bill really set the tone. He allowed trainees to practice safely, to test the waters of our critical thinking and our clinical skills, uh, and allowed us to have so many important experiences. I had my first intubation, felt ownership of my first patients, and grew in confidence at a time when I really, really needed it. Um, he's influenced my teaching, my patient care, my scholarship in immeasurable ways, and I've learned so much that I just want to say thank you, and really, on behalf of myself, Janet, and all of your past trainees, thank you so much, Bill. I really wish you many more arrows in your quiver. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here and speak about uh, Bill. And I'm from Montreal, so I'm not representing, I'm just representing outsiders like the SPCA dogs that Bill takes uh, when they're in distress, uh, one of them being me. So in 2000, um, after my dad had died of cancer and a terrible death that lasted a year and a half, and I had cancer myself, and I was going through divorce. And I had interviewed for theater school because I thought I shouldn't do medicine anymore. Um, I had to go to PS to present a Dink poster. Um, and I thought, you know, I'll go to see everything that has nothing to do with neonatology because I'll probably not do medicine very long. Um, and I selected uh, Drosophila medicine and uh, zebrafish uh, mutations and the bioethics podium. Um, so I went at the bioethics session and wow, these people were exciting compared to the average people in medicine. <laughs> um, and they were dressed differently. Um, and actually, I saw Bill, like, a revelation, a religious revelation almost, on the podium, who came with his hat and challenged everything that we knew. It was your statistics and memories quarterback phenomenon um, podium. And I thought, Geez, you know, I was like in a notion for the last year and a half, wondering what was the purpose of life and if life had any purpose. And finally, I saw a little island of possibility. I was, it wasn't a good uh, time in my life. So I, I rushed myself and threw myself with desperation on Bill and told him, I want to do what you do. I don't want the autonomy, um, justice, beneficence, crap ethics theory I've been learning. Like, how can I do, how can I do the ethics that you're doing? And um, maybe because I was, you know, hanging to him with desperation, he accepted to have a coffee with this nobody that he's never seen. Um, but I think it's because he does it uh, with everybody. Um, so we went to have a coffee, and what do you want to do? I didn't tell him about all the problems in my life. I kept it to my frustration with ethics, and he's like, oh, you have to start somewhere. There's too many things. Um, and since then, um, I, if I hadn't met him, I would probably be like a trainer in a gym or something, I, or in a theater somewhere not making money. And, you know. But it was a life-saving revelation. 
So the remainder of the talk, I'll speak about Bill as how I see him, unconventional and original, as uber intelligent, honest and challenging, and generous. Bill is so unconventional, it was so nice to see another angry person challenging everything that could be challenged. Um, and he's a devil's advocate. In research, he finds all these little places where everybody thinks they're right and just goes um, and I love doing that too, it's very fun. Um, in clinical, it looks like he's um, a bit weird too. So once when I was visiting in Chicago giving a talk, I had the worst UTI in my life. So he brought me Cipro and Septra and a liter of organic, organic, cranberry juice to be all taken at the same time for two days. And then afterwards, you don't need anything because you gotta kill the buggers and then it's over. And I'm like, okay, two Cipros, three Septras. I'm like, I'm not sure this is the right thing, but he's my PhD director. So, but I, I can see he's a bit extreme like this uh, in other things. And just in his titles, he always had screwed up titles for the, the Canadian Pediatric Society or any kind of conference for people. He died, you know, like, they just have to come to your talk. So there's so many titles. If you look at all the things that he's published, uh, The Mathematics of Morality, um, Neonatology's Never Been a Bargain, 500 Gram Infants and 800 Pound Gorillas in the <laughs> Delivery Room. But if you go on PubMed and look at all his articles, he's got like some sexiness in his titles. <laughs> Bill is also unconventional and original. Um, and it's really refreshing at ethics conference, well not ethics, but yeah, ethics with brown socks uh, philosophers, no offense to philosophers in the room, and um, at pediatric society with flower skirts and um, with you know the, the PAS outfit, which is tan pants, blue shirt, red tie, and a navy blue shirt, I hope nobody has that in the room. But it's nice to see, it's nice to see Bill with his hat and his scarf, I've chosen one for Edward, the Groningen scarf. Um, and Keith, there's still, um, um, Bill, there's still Keith who's actually giving you a little bit of a challenge there. This is uh, the princess and the prince who came to visit our unit and Keith, on purpose to piss off royalty and academics, uh, was not complying with the dress code and had <laughs> silver running shoes. Keith is also um, so intelligent. He knows about neonatology. Oh, and Bill too. <laughs> I see, I see Keith being a little bit jealous there. <laughs> My other mentor. Um, so Bill is very brilliant. He knows about neonatology, physiology. See Keith, you don't know about ethics and law, so too bad. Um, about ethics, law, economics. And actually, Bill can think about all these things at the same time. And, and sometimes we'll speak about something and something. It's, it's almost, it, it's like a volcano in his head. And he's so intelligent. It's, I don't know how he organizes his thoughts. And he can actually speak about them accurately in, in 10 words or 25 words, unlike me, who speaks for hours when I have my head bo boiling like that. And Bill is very honest um, and challenging, which is very good for trainees, especially the SPCA trainees from out of town that you take under your wing. Um, he came to McGill many times when he was supervising me for my PhD. Um, and he was actually banned from McGill. Keith will speak about this uh, later. <laughs> and he gave me professional recommendations of, you know, do you really want to stay here in your life? And which, actually I followed his recommendation and left, which was a very good career advice. Um, he was very honest about some research, so sometimes I'd speak to him very, oh, this is what I'm boring, just stop, this is never gonna make it. No, 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 tell me when it's over yet. <laughs> so I knew this, these were not good subjects. Um, and I don't know if, if Bill remembers my first, in 2002, my first two PS podiums, like one after the other at a conference, important conference. Um, at the sushi place in San Francisco where I was giving my talk and we were going, <laughs> it's fucking boring, everybody's, no, nobody's, yet. they're gonna leave the room and then you delete it one slide after the other and all that was left was the disclosure slide. <laughs> and the two talks, oh and the introduction slide too, there were two slides left. 
And the thank you slide, no, three slides left. And I, Bill, I've got no slides left. Well, just let's make a PowerPoint, but it's for tomorrow. Oh, we have time to make one for tomorrow. So there was no sandwich feedback ever. I don't know if you know the new, it's more of a, a, an American thing of a sandwich feedback, like you're here in time, you're dressing very well, you've got a good breath, your presentation's shit, and then, uh, but it's good that you're somebody who's very interesting. So two nice buns, and at the middle to have some meat. And with Bill, we never, sometimes it was crumbs to hold the meat in the middle. And sometimes we had, when we had the buns, and the, it, it means it, it was true. And then there was the second and the third PS podium and the nth, all these podiums. Um, and at the last PAS, I didn't ask for his advice. And I can't be the first person crying here, so I'm going to hold it myself. And I remember coming back, sitting down next to Bill, and he said, Annie, you don't need me anymore. And it was um, one of the biggest compliments I had. <clears throat> and also very nostalgic to think that you know, this phase was over. The thing is, I know he's like that with all the mentees um, that he's mentored over the years. So I'll give you the Bill Meadows slide. It's, it's got a, a trademark on it. <laughs> needs to be black and white, no blue and white and all that crap, as he says. <laughs> it needs to be minimalist, no fluff and fairies and flowers and stuff like this. 36 <laughs> font minimum <laughs> and max of four lines and read the fucking slide. <laughs> I don't know how often I've, I've heard that from, ah, read the fucking, <laughs> my okay. Delete this, delete this, delete this. <laughs> so this is one of the dress rehearsals with Bill, and you can see um, his scarf. He hadn't had his hat yet. <laughs> article I wrote with Bill. So what was left is the best interest is generally viewed as a guiding principle for decision making. If it is shown in court that. <laughs> and then there was many ideas from Bill on the side of the th that I had to reorganize in a paper. But I did exactly what he was asking. So, but that was the first. It was it got published in pediatrics in the end. Um, and so Bill is very generous with his ideas, with his thoughts, with his smiles. He recognizes people, shows people they're important, show trainees who have a spark of an interest that their spark is important, whatever big that spark. And mentoring and teaching for him is a vocation. And you can tell he has it in his heart to do this. It's a passion of his. And he gives everybody a chance. And it's very empowering for us later on when any student that comes knock at your door and you say, oh, I don't have time. You just have to say, Bill did the same. Bill did the same. You have to do this. And he's there for everybody, for his trainees, his friends, his collaborators. And he's a networking champion. So he's made me meet very important people in my life, like John and Martha. And a lot of people in this room, Lainey, Bridget, Dr. Siegler, Bree, Joanne, Naomi, Bonnie, Farn, you know, the list goes on. Um, that I've met through Bill, and because I knew Bill, and he was generous with having us uh, know each other. He's also helped me navigate through different professional, personal struggles and, and challenges. So being a trailer spouse, I think he was he, empathizing with me. I'm the trailer spouse of Keith Barrington here. And he, he says he's also a trailer spouse. Um, and I was always in the shadows of incredibly powerful and intelligent people. Um, so he told me how to play that role. And about three years ago, Keith was introduced as Annie Janvier's husband, which it was very touching to me. Um, and I was also the mother of a premature baby, Violette. That was when she was very small and when she got bigger. And how to actually ask decision things that I was researching in myself, I guess. And, how do you navigate between being the mom of a preemie baby and also researching the exact thing you are living? And he's also always supported me as an author of short stories in uh, neonatology. And this book will be translated, don't worry, Bill. Um, and you can read it in English. But he's always been very supportive of um, me being an author and writing different things. And he's always been there for us and his community of 
whether it's mentees, students, collaborators. I think Bill is an attending, an attending to his family, to babies, to students, colleagues, and in life. So maybe the, <laughs> the title should have been how Bill uh, saved my life. But uh, thank you, Bill, for everything you are. just for the video, there's no... Uh, and, okay. and I did learn Sunday after Sunday is what it looks like to be a coach who's a teacher. Um, a teacher of soccer, but as we all know, to be a teacher of soccer is to be a teacher of life. <laughs> now, also I guess I need to mention some of Bill's contributions to the lexicon of soccer. <laughs> there are the words cute and vicious. <laughs> I've heard them hundreds of times, but I still don't know what they mean. A girl would be dribbling the ball in the voice, and it's really quite a booming voice for a man who's not huge, um, would come saying, be cute now, be cute now, or be vicious, be vicious. <laughs> but the contrast clearly has something to do with using fine-grained soccer skills versus having a kind of forceful burst of energy. Um, but what confused me was first that, I, I mean, I could never tell why a given situation called for being cute rather than being vicious. <laughs> and second, I could never see any clear. Maybe after, during the reception, Bill will have a small group uh, yeah. meeting on cute versus vicious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Keith Barrington is next. Keith is also a neonatologist uh, from Montreal was head of the, the Division of Neonatology there for many years, but now uh, at, is a free man, has given up that job, uh, publishes uh, the most widely read blog about uh, uh, neonatology and neon neonatal research, neonatal research dot org. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And we're going to take a little change in direction right now because. Uh, my understanding of a festive was a group of scientific presentations, and not all of this cute um, <laughs> memories of them. So I'm going to give you a scientific presentation. As you can see from the slide, I don't follow Bill's uh, rules uh, for. Um, and first of all, the disclosures. Um, the other disclosure is that this is the first time in 15 years that I've done a presentation wearing a jacket. <laughs> this shows the uh, respect that I have for Bill. But just to sort of vary this a little bit, I also think I'd try and copy a bit of his style. <laughs> so um, uh, I actually got the request from John Lantos that there's no need for a scientific presentation too late. His emails get to me about 25 milliseconds, and it takes me about 25 days to read them, because uh, I'm not very as efficient as, as he and Bill are. Um, so I'm going to do for you, uh, present for you a systematic review and a meta-analysis <laughs> of the effect of a dose of Bill Meadow <laughs> on neonatal research. And for those of you who um, are involved in clinical research, <clears throat> first of all, a, a little background. I have to start with an introduction. So the introduction is that uh, my very first interactions with Bill date from um, when I was a very junior faculty in Edmonton and doing some research which was in, uh, along very similar lines to the research that Bill was doing, in investigating hemodynamics and specifically hemodynamics in piglets with pulmonary hypertension. Bill was doing a lot of work specifically with group B streptococcus and pulmonary hypertension and I was looking at that model and other models of pulmonary hypertension in, in uh, instrumented piglets. And so um, my first interactions with Bill was when I was presenting my very first posters um, from my animal model. Um, and Bill would, or every year, Bill would come over to my poster, look at the title, look at the introduction and the methods, and then without reading the results, he would turn to me and tell me what I had found. <laughs> he was always right. A couple of years later, I actually got a review back from Pediatric Research 
And I thought, that review sounds just like <laughs> Bill Meadow. <laughs> I can't imagine anyone else writing it in quite that way. And that's one thing I'm going to come back, is that Bill's very singular voice. <laughs> but this experience made me wonder, when he was right about the results of my research, is he always right? <laughs> And so the research question is, what are the effects of a dose of Bill Meadow on a neonatal research subject? So I've put this into this PICO format, which I hope we're all um, uh, 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 aware of, which is you have to ask your research question in terms of patient's intervention, control, outcome, and timing. So the patients here are newborn infants. The intervention is Bill Meadow. The control group is no Bill. The outcome is improved care and the timing is for the future. So what I've done is this systematic review of the literature. I compared the findings from results the bill has performed to findings of research on related, object, uh, related topics. So I, I started off doing a PubMed search for uh, Meadow W, and I looked at all the retrieved documents. I'm supposed to say this when you do systematic reviews these days. Uh, screen the titles, read the abstracts, but to be honest, I couldn't be bothered to write the full, to retrieve the full text. <laughs> And so there's several themes of Bill's research that have emerged uh, over the years, and many of these have already been talked about and will probably be touched on again. And as I said, there's pulmonary hypertension with or without group B strep in both in piglets and in babies, the, the use of, diff of resources in neonatology, how much it costs, standards of care and expert witnesses, predicting death, ethical issues and withholding and withdrawing care for sick newborns, and of course, uh, those last uh, four are all quite related. And then there's several other individual studies, such as a study of caffeine that he did. So to go back to pulmonary hypertension, um, Bill has described the effects of various interventions in his model. One of the things that uh, uh, I think was very important is he, he demonstrated that telazoline, which many of us were using at the time, was just not a selective agent in any way, caused as much systemic hypotension as it did to decrease the pulmonary artery pressure, at least in piglets, even when you give it by nebulization directly into the lungs. And he went on to show similarly that there was a lack of that in babies. I think partly because of that uh, data and others, telazoline is no longer used. In fact, it's no longer available in Canada. I'm not sure it's available at all in the USA. And many of the uh, younger members of this audience who are in neonatology won't have even ever really have heard of it. Um, a, a an a medication that was toxic and ineffective and which we've abandoned because of um, important research, including that of Bill. And then other findings that he had helped to define the pathophysiology and treatment options in pulmonary hypertension. For example, uh, 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 as you can see there from, from the references to uh, two papers that we uh, showed that we both were looking at the same thing in terms of the systemic, uh, the, the circulatory effects of epinephrine in, in pulmonary hypertension models in piglets he um, several years before I got round to doing it um, and showed that there's, uh, there might be some role for this epinephrine um, in, in piglets. Um, to go on to his research to do with caffeine, he showed an increase in cardiac output after loading of caffeine, uh, an increase of about 15%, and in fact it confirmed two slightly earlier studies. Um, and we now, know, now use caffeine very early, very frequently, in very many uh, very immature babies. And his uh, data confirms that the cardiovascular effects are mostly positive. And I can't do a systematic review without showing you a forest plot. <laughs> so here's a forest plot that I, uh, I could put together showing how uh, Bill's study, the, the, the second uh, of those three, um, uh, was actually the, the most powerful of the three studies, had many more babies than, than the other three, and, and the, the results are all very consistent. And I did want to point out that although I've put Meadow 2009 on the, on the forest plot, in fact, he would be the first, I know, to give credit to the, uh, to the people who actually uh, did many of the measurements and were involved in doing the, the studies. And um, he would be the first to, uh, to, to um, wish that that, that didn't say Meadow 2009, but Sol Solovechik 2009. So he, Bill went on to talk uh, to, to um, um, from that time on, I must say, after I started meeting Bill at the, the SBR meetings, every year I would meet up with him at the SBR meetings, even when he was no longer doing the piglet research, and I was still for a while doing that. I, I'm no longer doing that myself, and he would still be able, even though he was not in that field, to come up to my poster and tell me what I had shown, and if I hadn't shown it, then I must have done something wrong. <laughs> but one of the, the, the things that really um, 
sort of uh, impressed me about to Bill was then his, his work in the law and uh, in, in expert witnesses. And when I was doing this systematic review, I noted that he's actually published in law journals, and I don't know many other neonatologists who've published in the Duke, Duke Journal of Law. Um, but, and as he pointed out, that anyone with some experience can be called an expert witness and get on the stand and speak any crap that they want. Um, but that like anything else in medicine, standard of care should be evidence-based. He showed that evidence have often no idea what goes on, and they often don't remember what went on in the past. Much of the rest of his research has been around uh, these issues. And I was going to talk about them separately, but then I realized back in 2007 in the very interesting neonatal ethics journal called the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition, <laughs> uh, Bill had published this very nice um, review article. And I actually just want to, although this is many, many more words than Bill Meadow would ever allow on a slide, um, just um, quote from uh, a section of that review article to which actually points out this um, particular voice of Bill and if you read those those phrases you'd know this is Bill Meadow who's written this even if you didn't look at who, who the author was um, and he in fact had four issues that he talked about in that article and I'll come back to the fourth one later but basically he says that there's no credible ar arguments against NICU care that rely on invoking costs. The vast majority of infants admitted to the NICU survive. And medical caretakers are very poor at predicting who will survive. Um, another example of his singular voice is this, which you find, there's not very often you'll find this phrase in a scientific article. <laughs> a bit of drying, a slap on the butt, and they're good to go. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the visit to McGill that has been alluded to earlier because uh, once Annie um, had made contact with, uh, with Bill and invited him to McGill and was, uh, was doing her PhD with him, um, he was invited to McGill and he gave this amazing presentation. It was, as many of you will know, stimulating, challenging, funny, thought-provoking. The residents thought it was great. There were many of the residents actually gave this sort of evaluation. It's the best ethics talk we've ever had. And the result of that was that he was banned. <laughs> now, it, it, it may be because um, I remember one section, he was sat in front of a, a, a room of people, probably about half as many people as we have here, pediatric residents and the ethics people themselves from the ethics uh, group and Annie and I and the neonatologists and he would he would actually walk around the room and ask people questions as he was giving his presentations so he one of the things he, I remember him asking uh, was um, so you're this baby with trisomy 18 would you offer them cardiac surgery oh no 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 and why not and the answers were always couched in terms of oh um, it's not in their best interest, or it's not going to do them any good, or um, um, you know, similar sort of. Uh, um, we've got to, you know, we, we want to promote non-maleficence, <laughs> um, and he would say, no, 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 no. You know the real reason you want, don't want to do it? He's just too dumb, and that was the kind of things that makes you stand back and say, how can you say that? And you think. I know why he's saying that. He's saying that to make me think. He's saying that to provoke me to examine my own prejudices and my own preconceptions. And anyone with any sense knows that's, wh that's why he was saying that. But one of the group that banned him had previously written this gem. Frenetic comprehending calls for creative control of that which is meaningful and meaning making in a situation. <laughs> <laughs> for some people, it seems, clarity is a fault. To go back to the systematic review, um, Bill's talked about resource use, and now there's other people who followed him and talked about resource use. Uh, um, Lex Dorn, in particular, in Melbourne, has talked about the, the value of neonatology and how it's really good value for money. And Bill has also done some direct comparisons with the adult ICU, and it's also been now compared to cardiac intensive care in particular, which is the, the most costly in, uh, form of medical intervention for quality adjusted life year. Also to the PEDS ICU, to renal dialysis programs, and certainly in 
in comparison to the latest new agent for advanced breast cancer, NICU is remarkably good value for money. When I talk about does uh, the systematic review of predictions of survival, I don't think anyone else has done quite what Bill and his colleagues have done, but all of the data about trying to predict outcomes in, in babies have shown that he was right all along and that the only way you can predict outcome uh, survival with more than 50% 50, 50 accuracy is actually just from base on group characteristics, not for individuals. Uh, people are working in the NICU are lousy at predicting outcomes. And predicting long-term outcomes as well, in fact, one of the things that Bill has done, again, in, in collaboration here with some of the other people in this room, in particular Brie, shown there's no gradient of gestational age on long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes among survivors. And that's been confirmed by another systematic review by Greg Moore. So this is Greg Moore's data on, uh, on your uh, left, showing that when you look at, uh, at outcome studies of uh, formerly extremely preterm babies, once they reach um, five to six years, or five, um, four to eight years of age was when he did the systematic review, there's actually no significant effect of which week you were born on the um, developmental outcomes among survivors. And there's similar data in the graph, which is on your right, um, from which, I, again, I've said there, Meadow 2012, but he would the first, be the first, again, to say that that was Brie Andrews' work that he uh, collaborated with. So let's go back to the journal, this paper in the Journal of Patriotic, whatever it's called. <laughs> and I, I can uh, ask you the question, is Bill ever wrong? Well, here I wanted to address his fourth point. Because he says, fourth and finally medical caretakers seem to be reasonably good at identifying burdensome outcomes while babies are still sick enough that an alternative is ethically possible. So only 5% of ventilated extremely low birth weight babies predicted to die before NICU discharge will be alive and neurologically unscathed at two years of age. And here I have to say, Bill, I love you, but you're wrong. <laughs> because your definition of what's neurologically unscathed is not appropriate. Having a Bailey 2 score less than 70 doesn't mean that you are scathed. If you can be scathed, I guess if you can be unscathed, you can be scathed. And this is some data from, uh, to get back to caffeine, from the study of the long-term follow-up of the five-year follow-up of the children in the caffeine um, for apnea of prematurity study, where you can see that the uh, outcomes at 18 months of age, which are along the bottom um, axis, are really very poorly correlated with the actual the long-term uh, intellectual capacity of the children. And in fact, that in general, the scores at five years of age are much better than those 18 months of age and that all the dots in that parallelogram are wrongly classified as being scathed or being damaged. Um, if you classify them at 18 months of age, when you see them again at five years of age, you'll find that their developmental scores are within the normal range. So I think, uh, Bill, you've still got some more work to do. You need to go back and see whether or not we can actually predict outcomes that are more meaningful um, with more profound neurodevelopmental impairments and not just Bailey scores at 18 months to two years of age. So how has Bill affected uh, my career? Well, I'm still uh, investigating some of those areas that, um, that um, I was investigating all those years ago, the, about hemodynamics, hemodynamics and sepsis. We're still doing some more caffeine studies. I've become involved with um, Annie and Barbara Fado looking at uh, interventions and outcomes of children with trisomy 18 and 13 uh, and have collaborated even with Bill on some ethics papers. And I'm blogging about almost anything to do with neonatal research. So what's the conclusions of my systematic review? A dose or two of Bill Meadow in a neonatal research domain improves outcomes for babies. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Oh, you're right.